I'm Marcia Weber, and I welcome you to the 14th annual Maida and John Spiegler Holocaust Remembrance Lecture, our first Zoom lecture with speaker Manny Lindenbaum. Manny was going to speak at last year's lecture, which of course we had to cancel because of the pandemic. We were delighted when he said that he would speak this year instead, and we thank both Manny and his wife, Annabelle, for developing their skill with the new technology so we can Zoom. Speaking of the technology, we will have a question and answer session tonight. And there is a Q&A icon that should show up either at the bottom of your com computer screen or at the top of your mobile device screen. You can click on that and type in your question at any point in the lecture. Manny will answer questions at the end of his talk. Also, we are recording this session and the video will be available shortly on the website where you registered. Tonight's Zoom uh, expert, Luke, will also send out a follow-up email with the YouTube link to people who've registered for the lecture. Through this lecture series, we take on the important mission of reminding older people and telling younger ones of the events of the Holocaust. With their stories, our speakers have shared with us a tragic and terrible time in their lives and in the history of the world. This is in the hope that all of us who listen to the stories will work to make sure these events do not happen again, that we fight hatred and bigotry and aim for a just and peaceful world. I hope we will all make that commitment. Before we hear Manny's story, we will hear from two of the grandsons of Maida and John Spiegler. First, we will hear from Micah Amshin and then from Ori Paskind. Good, e good evening, everybody. Uh, hi there, my name is Micah Amshin and I'm one of Maida and John's grandchildren speaking to you today from Toronto, Canada. Thank you so much for spending your time with us this evening to listen to Manny's story and preserve the memories of those that perished in the Holocaust and those that survived. My grandparents, Maida and John, had different experiences getting from Europe to the United States. And I'm always humbled when I think of their stories and their perseverance. They instilled in us the importance of giving back and of supporting those not as fortunate as ourselves. To this day, my family and I do our best to emulate these values by giving our time and our resources to nonprofits and causes that we care about and that are making a positive difference in the world. Something that mattered deeply to both grandma and grandpa. While I'll always treasure our trips down to Corning and spending time at the Museum of Glass, one of my earlier and most profound memories is of my grandma Maida speaking to my religious school class at synagogue in Toronto and sharing her story, which wasn't easy to hear. It was the first time I had heard about her experiences and probably the first time many of my classmates had heard directly from a Holocaust survivor. That experience had a profound impact on me and everyone listening that day, and I'm honored that their legacy continues through the annual Spiegler Lecture. Thank you for supporting their mission for Holocaust remembrance and education, which are so vital to combating bigotry and discrimination around the world. Now, I'll turn it over to Uri. Hi, good evening. My name is Uri Paskind, one of Meta and John Spiegler's grandsons. I'm fortunate to have had a close and meaningful relationship with my grandparents. Now that I'm in my 30s, I've been able to more clearly reflect back and better understand who they really were as people and the values that they embodied within their lives and within their community. Aside from the unconditional love that they always showed, learning and education was of utmost importance. It was clear they believed education provides a vehicle for obtaining knowledge. As we know, knowledge helps to unlock doors and opportunities to grow both as individuals and as professionals. One of the greatest gifts I received from my grandparents was the financial support to attend the University of Maryland, where I graduated with a degree in aeronautical engineering and went on to have a career working as a systems engineer for the US Navy. While I've gained a tremendous amount of professional experience, my job has also afforded me personal opportunities such as traveling around the world, which is one of the most enriching ways to learn and grow, something I cherish and do not take for granted. My grandmother's vision to establish the means to educate younger generations through academia, as well as through the moving stories of Holocaust survivors 
is a testament to the same value. I know my grandparents felt it was their obligation to continue what they started 14, for us to continue what they started 14 years ago. I'm grateful to them, to Marsha and the team, as well as to all of you who decided to join us tonight to listen to Mandy Lindenbaum's courageous and moving story. By continuing to gather here as community each year, we are proof that we are fulfilling the obligation my grandparents set forth all those years ago. I'm honored to introduce our guest tonight, Manny Lindenbaum. As you'll experience in just a minute, Manny exudes a vibrancy, seemingly boundless energy, and a booming voice perfect for public speaking. I recall these incredible attributes from when I knew Manny as a kid. Seeing him and Annabelle at Jewish Federation of Ocean County events or at Yom HaShoah events at my father's synagogue, Congregation Ahavat Shalom in Lakewood, New Jersey, where we grew up. Amazingly, after all these years, Manny and Annabelle look exactly the same and seem just as vibrant, which is wonderful to see. Manny, if we were to ask, how have you remained so youthful and full of life through all these years, I believe we'd find the answers in your survival story, which we're looking forward to hearing. So please join me in welcoming Manny Lindenbaum, and thank you. So usually I start out saying why I'm talking at all, because I just don't want you to hear the story. Everybody has a story, but I, I think there's something to be learned from it. Uh, my grandfather, Solomon Lindenbaum, in uh, 1810, maybe, uh, lived in uh, Galicia, in Dolina Galicia. And uh, he wasn't doing well. He had a large family and uh, they were having trouble making a living. They were not, didn't feel really welcome there. So they looked around to find a place where they would really be welcome. And they did find such a place. They moved, eventually had 11 children and they moved to Hanover in Germany and they were welcome. They were welcomed by uh, the Jewish community, which was, wasn't that large. They were welcomed by their Christian neighbors and they were really doing well there. Uh, my uh, father moved uh, to the Ruhr Valley to a small town uh, by the name of Unna. And like his father, he started uh, a small clothing store. And again, the small Jewish community welcomed them, but the larger Christian community, they were really very much at home. Uh, my earliest memories were of the store or the little apartment where they lived upstairs was full of my sister's friends. She was eight years older than me and nearly all her friends were Christian. They were, she had Jewish friends, but they were Christian. And uh, everything went well uh, until uh, a depression took place. I think before I said 1800, I meant 19. Uh, a depression took place and people were out of jobs and the train stopped running and the price of food was so high people couldn't afford it. And they were gonna have a free and democratic election, which they did. And one party came up and said, the German people are much better than anybody else. We are, are super people. And the others are Niedermenschen, lower, lower people. And if you vote for us, we're not gonna only have the trains running. We're not only gonna have you walking upright and being proud of being a German, but you're also not gonna have to have communists, socialists, and Jews around you. The, Germany will be clear, we, there, there will be no Germans with disabilities because Germans are super people. And 
in this free and democratic election, the German people elected Hitler and the Nazis. And the election was, it was a, a, a free election. And they closed their eyes to the costs. And sure enough, they kept their word. The, in school, uh, the, the kids were walking around uh, with uniforms. And if there was anybody else who wasn't like them, they would beat them up. Uh, I didn't go to school. Uh, I wasn't quite old enough and my parents were scared of sending me. My uh, brother did go to school and practically every day he came home beaten up. And I remember early on uh, my mother going to speak to the teacher and saying, what's going on? He was getting beaten up in class <clears throat> and he lied. He said, there's nothing I could do. Because the fact is, there were places where people did stand up and it made a difference. But in Una, nothing. And uh, my father had to put a J in the window of the store. And all of our close Christian friends, one by one, disappeared. And <clears throat> I don't believe that my sister's friends who also disappeared, I don't believe that they were happy with what was happening, but they were, they would became total bystanders. They be, in, in, if the, the, the one friend of my sister who stayed with her became very unpopular. <coughs> and uh, uh, things got worse and worse. Uh, in uh, uh, 1938, just uh, before Kristallnacht, two weeks before, uh, uh, I, uh, I had not quite turned six at that point. And uh, uh, a, an officer came into the store and said that uh, your grandparents came from the East, therefore, you have to report to the police station with one small suitcase and uh, 10 mark. And uh, my life in Una was not that bad. I had my brother, my sister, my family. <coughs> and, uh, and I remember a friend. Uh, I remember him really well because he lived on Krumpfuhlstrasse, a crooked foot street, which is still that. And, uh, I remember my father uh, looking at his empty cash register, gathering the family together and uh, taking us to our last Christian friend to try to decide what to do. And the logical co question at this point is, why didn't he just take his family in the car and get out of there? You know, I mean, we weren't welcomed anymore. Well, first of all, we did not know anybody who had a car didn't know anybody. Uh, we couldn't go to America because the door was closed. The only way you could get to America is if you had some kind of a contact in America who had some influence with somebody. And that wasn't going to happen. To get to Palestine, one boatload of Jews, the British actually sank the boat. <coughs> and. Uh, in the entire British Empire, which went around the world, Jews were, were not permitted. Yeah, uh, Dominican Republic, Haiti took in a few. Uh, uh, Shanghai uh, let, let in some Jews, but basic, basically the, the world was closed. So the, my parents did not have a choice. And uh, the... Uh, after spending some time with our last Christian friends, we did go to the police station. And uh, I, it was Thursday. So how do I know it was Thursday? Well, two, two reasons. Number one, I looked in the, the history to find out. And secondly, they kept us there for 36 hours. Now, why did they keep us there for 36 hours? 
it's, it blows the mind what I think the reason was. They kept us there for 36 hours at that railway station. I remember somebody brought us some food. I don't know who it was. Probably one of the last Christian friends that we had. And uh, we were put on the train as the sun went down on Friday night. And uh, my Zeta, uh, who was blind and had never traveled on the Sabbath, he was, he was the orthodox, uh, uh, really orthodox part of our family. Uh, uh, when we got on the train, I remember sitting with him and he started the Friday night services. And so why did they keep us there till the sun went down? Some very small, tiny German who strutted around thought this gave him pleasure to heap a little bit of extra uh, humiliation on people. And uh, these, these bullies, these Nazis, they were so small and minuscule in reality that uh, it, it blows the mind as when I talk to kids, like that's what bullies are. But anyway, we were on the train. Uh, in the morning, we arrived on the Polish border. Uh, the, on the uh, German side, the town was called Benschen. And uh, we got out at Benschen and uh, we were chased towards the border. And there were people who could hardly walk. There was my blind grandfather, my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, and hundreds of others. I think it was a total of 17,000 or over three days who chased across the border. That was uh, two weeks before Kristallnacht and uh, just before I turned six years old. And uh, when we got to the border, the Polish guards tried to keep us out. We overwhelmed them and we were in Poland. And uh, as we were, people were looking around trying to figure out what to do, uh, a scene which repeats itself today happened. Uh, Polish uh, peasants uh, on, uh, with horses and carts came towards us, said they were gonna help and grabbed people's suitcases, loaded them up and stole them and took off. And uh, these memories flood back into my brain when I see refugees at the border today uh, taking advantage of and, and murdered and all kinds of horrible things are happening to them. And uh, we walked the uh, six miles to a town by the name of uh, Spanschen. Uh, when we got to Spanschen, you know, I, uh, I have so many friends who were Polish and who spent time in concentration camps and they tell horrible stories about how they were treated when they tried to return. Uh, and uh, that was not our experience. When we got to this town, there were more of us than there were of them. Uh, they did not welcome us. They did not take care of us. They let some people sleep in the stables. Uh, they let people sleep in the streets. Uh, there was a burnt out uh, Mueller. It was five stories and uh, there was nothing in it. And my family together with a couple of hundred other people got there. We, uh, there was uh, straw on the floor and there was not, nothing else. So in my memory, you would think as somebody who hadn't turned six, this would be the biggest horror of my life. Not true, because I had my mother, I had my father, my brother and my sister and my friend. Uh, and uh, within 24 hours, the Jewish aid organizations uh, from um, uh, Warsaw were there. And uh, one thing I, I do remember is, uh, they handed out cotton bags so to put the straw in so we had a place to sleep. And uh, that 
did make, make quite a bit of difference. And from then on, we did have enough to eat. Uh, there was naturally no uh, toilets, there was no water, there was no lights. <coughs> but uh, I was fr freer to walk in the, in the streets than I had been in Una. In Una, when uh, I snuck out of the house to go to a Nazi rally, this is a mem the memory which sticks with me because when my mother, she was so horrified when I got back, I remember the beating I got as she was worried for my life. And uh, in, uh, uh, in Spongen, I, I have no such, I have no such memories. They, uh, I, I know that some of, the, some of us who were able to get money were able to rent places. Uh, and uh, some people who had outside connections were able to get to Shanghai uh, uh, or other places, but you needed two things. You needed money and you needed somebody on the outside who was able uh, able to help. Well, I have met people who made it from Spanchen, uh to Shanghai. Uh, and uh, so we were there for 10 months. Uh, and we were in the, the Mule in that uh, place the, the whole time. Uh, and the uh, as a group, uh, it was amazing when I read about it, how we were organized with the help of uh, Hyas and other Jewish organizations. Uh, and uh, uh, schools were started and, uh, and, uh, and every, everything else. But uh, at the end of 10 months, uh, the uh, German army was on the border and there was panic because rumors had circulated about what could happen. And, uh, uh, the uh, aid organization, Hias uh, uh, and, uh, and, and Joint, got us to the railway station. And uh, in the midst of all this chaos, uh, somebody yelled out uh, something about a kinder transport. Now, the kinder transport, uh, a congressman, two congressmen, uh, put in legislation to bring 20, to save the lives of 20,000 Jewish kids. And it, they couldn't get it out of committee. Some of the comments were that we're gonna let enemy aliens in. And uh, uh, that didn't work. And in England, uh, the Quakers and, and, the, and the Jewish community and others uh, campaigned and the British government had agreed to take in 10,000 ch children. And uh, on the condition that they leave when the war's over and each one have a, somebody who would guarantee that they wouldn't be a, a burden. Uh, and uh, at this point, the 10,000 kids were in England already. They had come from Austria, Czechoslovakia and Germany. And uh, uh, they were in all different kinds of situations. So my mother, and this is probably the most traumatic moment of my life. Uh, my, my mother pushed us over to this man and turned around and uh, uh, got on a train to go to Grodno in the east. And uh, I was furious uh, as I saw my friend screaming and crying, Herbert. Uh, I remember him well. He was screaming and crying. And uh, his mother ran back, kissed him, hugged him, and took him with her. And when I did research on him, I found out that his mother and him had both been murdered in Auschwitz, while my parents had saved my life and my brother's life. Uh, but I was furious and uh, uh, I became a real problem for everybody. Uh, on the, the way, the next 10 days, we traveled across Poland and we stopped at an Ort village. Uh, 
that's a Jewish training camp where my sister was uh, learning a trade. And um, she joined us, she was coming and, and I saw my Zeta for the last time. He was nearby in a, a, home, a Jewish home for the blind. And uh, uh, I remember that was a, was a happy event until we got to the boat. The boat was a Polish warship by the name of the Warszawa. And uh, this was uh, two days before the start of the German invasion. And uh, as we were going towards the boat, uh, somebody went up to my sister and said, you're not going, you're 14, you're too old, you're going another boat, uh, there's no room, which wasn't true. And uh, I was uh, totally furious. I remember running away and my sister found me and dragged me back to the boat and held me while they shaved my head to get rid of the lice. And uh, me and my brother were uh, on the Washava uh, heading to England. And uh, I was a problem for everybody on the boat. And uh, when we got to England, I was furious and out of control. And a nice Jewish family uh, took my brother in uh, and uh, picked him up at the uh, pier and uh, the rest of us were uh, shifted to different places across England. Uh, I, I remember uh, very vividly what happened with my first home. This lovely uh, British la uh, lady who didn't speak a word of my language uh, uh, kept me for 24 hours and uh, uh, and was and attempted to be nice to me. The next one, uh, I remember getting beaten, and I went in England uh, from one place to another for in the, in the beginning, being a problem for everybody. Uh, the fact is that the British saved the lives of ten thousand Jewish children. There's no question about it, and uh, many of them the families that took us in uh, did it to do to do a mitzvah uh, and then others uh, took in 14 or 15 year olds uh, as maids uh, or as, uh, my friend he was on a farm and he was actually picked up uh, by the British police uh, he was uh, Satma orthodox he was picked up by the British police on Yom Kippur when he was attempting to get to a synagogue. But I only have uh, good feelings to, towards England. I think what they did was fabulous. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, I ended up, uh, I think I spent one day at a Jewish boys home and picked a fight with the biggest guy there and ended up in the hospital. And so I spent the entire time in England, uh, over six years in Christian homes, going from one to the other. The last one uh, that I went to, the Spantons in e England, they were really nice. Uh, I stayed with them for three years and their granddaughter found me on YouTube and I'm in contact with that family. Uh, they, uh, they, they helped me come back, back together. When, uh, when I hear about uh, children separated from their parents at the border is what happened in Mexico and the United States, I, I get furious, I go crazy because I know that it took me a good 20, 30 years to recover from that, from that separation. And I, and I know that some of the kids are there and I, uh, it, the, we, we have so much to do to make the world a better, a better place. Uh, the, the good part about what happened to me in England, besides this family who were very strict and decent to me. And while I continued to 
be in trouble in school and getting caned on a regular basis. Uh, at that house, I was an angel because I wanted, didn't want to lose that home. And uh, they were strict and uh, they, were, they were good. But all this whole time, there was always somebody in that town who somehow or the other heard about me and reached out to me. And uh, I think it's so important when we see somebody in trouble to reach out because uh, I, I went to a reunion, uh, I guess 70 years later, and uh, I, I was amazed. I saw people there uh, that, that, that I knew and uh, some of them, with, because of that, I'm with the family and uh, somebody with a clipboard came up to me and said, give me three sentences for a headline. <laughs> I laughed and said, yeah, I'm gonna give you my life story in three sentences. I said, all right, here's the three sentences. I wanna say thank you to Mrs. Knowles. Mrs. Knowles was the vicar's wife, the, the minister in town. And at the worst of times, she somehow or the other, I have no idea how, she found me and she took me over to the vicarage and she gave me milk and cookies and uh, uh, the, the, the places I lived at, they didn't have indoor plumbing uh, and uh, she would give me a bath. And uh, uh, I, I, I remember she made a huge difference in my life. So I told this guy, I wanna say thank you to Mrs. Knowles. There, there were others, but let me say thank you to Mrs. Knowles. She's the main one. So he took out this little device and he went boom, 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 boom and handed it to me. And I look at him like he's crazy. And he said, just talk. So I say, all right, it's gotta be her. So I start talking to her and I'm getting a stone wall, nothing. And then I say, don't you remember your daughter came home from college and gave me a stamp collection. And I still have it. You know, it's, uh, it's falling apart and there's only about 10 stamps in it, but I treasure it. And she said, that was me. And uh, she was at a nursing home in, in South Africa. So when I hung up, I gave him back his phone and I said, how, what, what were you doing with her number? How did you get that? How did you know what I was gonna say? He said, do you really think that when she reached out to you, she didn't do it for all the kids that she knew who were in trouble. And wow, uh, it, every time I think about that, I am searching for somebody to reach out to. Uh, and uh, there, there, there were others in town. Uh, and uh, it, it was a small town and uh, we had, it had to be a pain in the neck having uh, 70 Jewish refugee kids there. Uh, uh, the, the, the others were nearly all at a Jewish boys home, but uh, every time I went there, I got into trouble and uh, uh, that didn't work. I'm about ready for questions. Otherwise I'll have to ask them myself. Are there any yet? I guess not. All right, I'll, I'll ask myself the first question. Uh, Hey, how did you get to the United States? Uh, well, I got to the United States, my uncle. Now I, uh, the, re the reason I'm able to, I, I'm having such a fantastic life. Number one is having Annabelle as a wife for 63 years and uh, having great grandchildren now, uh, which makes, uh, all the difference in the world, but volunteering and making a difference is what uh, gets me exciting. I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm always concerned. I, I've gone to peace rallies. And by the way, when I go to peace rallies, when I've gone to environmental rallies, when I volunteered on kibbutz, I met or would always meet German young people. Now in the beginning, my stomach would tighten up because uh, what happened to my sister? She was 14 years old, she was murdered. My mother, my father, my savior, they, they were murdered. They were murdered by the Germans. Uh, 
and my stomach would tighten up and I would withdraw until I realized that what am I doing? These people were not alive then. And I slowly started to get German friends and realized that they have they, that they have real, real trauma when they know uh, what their parents or their grandparents either did or were bystanders. And uh, it's, it's got to be really, really difficult. I, uh, I, I know I, I met an Israeli who did a workshop with the children of Holocaust survivors and the children of Nazis and uh, the children of the Nazis had such deep trauma. Uh, and, uh, oh, I was talking, when, when you get to be my age, you sometimes lose your track of thought. Uh, and, how I came to America. Oh, how I came to America. So, uh, so I was telling about my volunteering because okay. uh, one of the places that I volunteered in, in the past was in prisons. I, uh, uh, Alternative to Violence Project is a Quaker group which does three-day workshops in prisons. And years back, when I heard about them, I got so excited. I was on their board. I did many, many uh, three-day workshops. And it was about alternative to violence, how to look at a violent situation and find out a commonality. And uh, uh, it, it was so great. Well, my uncle, he didn't know anything about alternative to violence. He, uh, had a temper. He was in a uh, in an internment camp in uh, Holland, and uh, he saw a pregnant woman getting kicked in the stomach. And I got, didn't get this from him. He never told me that. But somebody who was there told me about how he got out. And he went and he beat the man up in about thirty seconds, and then they beat him unconscious and they threw him on a train to go back to be killed. And there was a Dutch underground. Uh, it was very difficult to survive in, in Holland uh, because most of the Jews in hiding uh, were given up by somebody or the other. But there was an underground and they got him off that train and they took him to a man by the name of Jaap Pendrick. And, uh, there's uh, the great book, I met the author, uh, who uh, for 1200 Jewish young men, he gave papers that they were working for the Nazis. And uh, every one of them survived. And my uncle was able to take this paper and go from Holland to France and from France to Africa. In Africa, he wrote a letter to a brother who was in the United States, who went to somebody else who got a hold of a liquor baron by the name of Bronfman, uh, who pulled enough strings to get my aunt and uncle uh, uh, in uh, 1942. They arrived uh, at Ellis Island. Uh, and uh, if the uh, people at Ellis Island had known that my aunt had stomach typhus, which was very common in the camps, uh, they would not have let them in, they would have sent them right back to their death, but they didn't catch it. And they worked in sweatshops. My, my aunt went for five weeks to Mount Sinai Hospital and um, they, they worked uh, for a year in sweatshops. They saved up $1,500. The Jewish Agricultural Society gave them $1,500. With that, they were able to buy a farm in Farmingdale, New Jersey. And in 1946, uh, they brought us uh, uh, to the United States. So that's, uh, that's how I got there. M my brother, if they would have given him a physical examination uh, at Ellis Island, they would have sent him back too. Uh, he had rotten teeth. He'd always lived in Jewish homes, uh, but nobody he didn't get any medical uh, care at all. And uh, he actually spent a few months uh, at the hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, 
uh, and uh, Hayas uh, was able to show me documents of how they help because uh, while we were on the chicken farm, uh, we were always very close to bankrupt from the beginning on. Uh, so we still don't have a question yet. This is Marsha. Oh. Um, we have uh, someone asking how you met Annabelle. Oh, uh, the, the, the way she puts it on a, on a very blind date. And uh, <laughs> <clears throat> that was like 64 years ago. And uh, uh, we, we have had so many adventures together. Very blind date. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've had so, so many adventures together. We've volunteered on kibbutz. Uh, we have uh, uh, volunteered uh, on the Hudson River on the Clearwater with Pete Seeger and others. Uh, and uh, we actually took a, uh, uh, got together with a group uh, who was trying to bring America and the Soviet Union closer together uh, and to fight against pollution. And we did a, uh, a 28 day sail from uh, Lenin, uh, from New York to Leningrad and every place along the North Atlantic, we put a net down and came up with uh, oil, uh, tar and plastic. And it was horrible then and it's so much worse now. And uh, we have so much to fight for to make this uh, a, bet a, a better world. And when I say never again. Uh, I, I say never again uh, will we be bystanders. Uh, we won't be bystanders for the environment. We won't be bystanders uh, with people dying at the border. Uh, and uh, luckily uh, for us, the organizations like HIAS, which originally only helped Jewish people for 100 years and is now helping refugees all over the world. And I'm doing it a little bit with them. And uh, uh, when uh, President Obama uh, was looking for somebody to light the candles in the White House, he looked for somebody who was a refugee and who was somewhat active uh, with refugees today. And uh, uh, it, it was a major event. I was there with uh, grandchildren with Annabelle. And uh, uh, I, I think my best memory of that is that when I got the invitation, uh, I was looking, I was sitting at my desk and there's a picture of Ruchin, my sister. And I literally have thought of her every single day since I left. I, there has not been a day that I didn't think of her. She didn't have a life. She acted as a mother figure to me. And uh, I still can't understand how anybody can kill a kid. I, it just blows my mind. And it is actually totally impossible unless you look on somebody else as being less than you. And I can't do that. I can't do that. We're, 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 we're all the same. And uh, ne never again means you, you fight for a better world. Uh, uh, talking about the White House. Oh, uh, so, oh yeah. So uh, Annabelle just reminded me what I was starting to say. Uh, so when I was got the uh, the call, I'm looking at my sister's picture, and I'm feeling very sad thinking about her. I'm going to the White House, and uh, my uh, eldest granddaughter Simone called called at that moment, and I told her. She said, "Zeta, it's not a problem." What you do is you take that picture, make a copy, and take her, Ruth, with you to the White House. Oh, and uh, I was telling the, uh, uh, I was telling the president's wife, and her name in a minute. Michelle. Michelle. <laughs> uh, Michelle. Michelle. I was telling Michelle. Uh, that's why I'm married. She's, and uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm telling her. Uh, that story and uh, the president 
heard it and he was speaking to a rabbi across the way and he came running over and he took the picture and I have this beautiful picture of my, him and me and my, Annabelle and my uh, uh, one or two grandchildren with the picture and Ruth was there and uh, it means an, a, a lot to me. Uh, some of the, uh, my relatives did manage to escape. Uh, uh, my grandfather from Hanover, uh, early on, he made Aliyah and moved to Israel. Uh, some of the cousins uh, got to Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Uh, they got there on tourist visas and went from one place to another. Uh, my, my cousin, Rita, uh, uh, she, single mom, and uh, she got to England and was taken in by a Scottish family who wanted a daughter. And uh, I have seen copies of the letters that she wrote to Palestine where uh, she's crying, she's in despair. They want me to be a daughter. They want me to convert. And uh, she was uh, to totally miserable. And uh, uh, eventually she did convert and she has the most beautiful Scottish family that I could wish for. And we're, we're close. Uh, they feel that they're, they're, they're Christians who feel themselves Jewish. Uh, and uh, eventually when my cousin died and I visited her many times when I, they found all the letters that her mother uh, had written up in the attic unopened. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it's, the, the, the stories from England uh, have, you know, have everyone, everyone is t totally different. Uh, question number two. I was wondering if you have uh, been able to go back to Germany or to Poland? Well, and what that was like. So uh, I was uh, speaking at uh, Rookdale Change, which is a Holocaust uh, center. And um, I was speaking, my daughter was speaking, a granddaughter was speaking. And, uh, and there's my friend uh, in the audience. And I look at him and I remembered that I'd gone to all kinds of fantastic bike rides with him. And so I, I said then, I am returning to where my family was murdered, to where my Zeta was, my sister was, <clears throat> and I'm gonna do the whole thing on a bicycle because I don't want, uh, I, I don't wanna be going on buses or trains. I don't wanna do that. Uh, it didn't quite turn out that way a, a little bit. Uh, so I did go back and uh, Annabelle helped arrange it. My uh, wife uh, and um, my grandson, Jacob, did, did, did a lot of work putting it, uh, putting it together. And uh, uh, along the way, two of my grandchildren were with us for 28 days. We did over 1700 miles only the last 200 on a bicycle. Uh, and uh, it, it, it was trauma and relief in a way. Uh, while the, the woods, you, you know, I looked, at, I, I looked at all this darkness and I was able to see some, to see some light. I was able to see that Many people in the next generation uh, had had not only admitted what happened, but found out how they could make a difference. And uh, in in many ways, that trip, the the darkness uh, turned to light. Uh, I did have a couple of uh, uh, I think out out of the 20, 28 days, there was. Uh, two incidences 
where I saw uh, hatred. Uh, in, uh, I think it was in Poland, we were at a hotel and every room and every wall had anti-Semitic uh, portraits of Jews with pennies. And I remember that night I didn't sleep. I kept checking the rooms where my grandchildren were sleeping and uh, worrying about them. Uh, I was up all night, but that, that, was, that was one. And one hotel in Germany, when we went to check in, he, the owner had seen my picture in the paper and I could see, he looked at me and the color drained out of his face. He says, you are not coming into my hotel. And he attempted to, ch and did chase us out. Uh, but, but that was the, all of us. Uh, but besides that, people couldn't have been more helpful. Uh, so when, when we, we needed somebody to show us the way, they would stop what they were doing. Uh, they would come. We would stop in a store and ask somebody, and they would send somebody to, to show us what we were looking for. And uh, it, it was a, a thing of beauty. Uh, when uh, we got to Germany and we got on the bicycles, somebody from my hometown who had a vague relationship uh, back to 38, uh, his uh, mother had a relationship there. Uh, and he uh, was obviously Christian. And when he greeted us, he had us go around him as he sang Shalom Chavarim. And uh, uh, he uh, uh, biked with us uh, to Una. Uh, with very, with many stops along the way. Uh, and in Una, I was really happy. We were met by the Farah. That's the minister from the church. And the reason he, he met us, I had returned to Una one time before with my uh, Annabelle and my daughter Simone. And we, uh, they, they were putting in Struppelsteiner, uh, this man who wanted to make a difference. And there were a lot of people who wanted to make a difference. And so one night he did, I don't know, 60 or more uh, plaques he put in the pavement, permanent in the pavement with the names of the people they had killed in front of their residence, in front of their store. Uh, and uh, when they were doing it in my hometown, I was invited and um, the minister from the church uh, was was there, and actually, the the highlight of that was a German who I'm still in touch with. He came with his three children, and he said, "My three children are the same age as you, your brother, and your sister were when we did what we did," and he used the word "we," and I want them to meet you. And I want them to know that, that, you, that you're here and to know who you are. And uh, we, we're, we're now in touch with them. But when they were putting down the Stroppersteiner, the, the minister spoke. And he said, uh, was talking about the past and uh, he knew a lot more about my family than I did. I was amazed. Uh, and um, there were tears in his eyes. And I said, What's the matter with your tears? You were not alive. You had nothing to do with it. And he very quietly said, my church was. Um, I, I don't know how uh, popular that would make him saying that, but it's the truth. It's not that the church committed the atrocities, uh, but they were bystanders, 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 uh, bystanders. So when we came back with the bicycles, uh, we were greeted uh, by the town officials. And then the Farah uh, took us to the Jewish community, uh, to the synagogue, uh, which has quite a few members today, probably as many as before, but most, uh, mostly from Russia. Uh, and. Uh, 
uh, we were welcomed uh, by the Jewish community there, uh, which were, I, I, I found it really beautiful that the Farah took us there. And, uh, uh, and I, I, got, I got this good feeling when I really got a good feeling when uh, uh, my friend who rode his bicycle with us, when he wrote me a letter saying, I've got a job now teaching Syrian and Afghanistani refugees German, and I'm volunteering every available moment of my spare time to make them welcome and make them part of us. And this is the best time of my life because they are us. That was what he wrote. And a subsequent letter after uh, racism seemed to become more acceptable worldwide, <clears throat> he wrote a letter, he said, I'm continuing what I'm doing. It's much harder now because the racists now raise their heads. And, uh, uh, but he's, he's still doing what he's doing. And uh, uh, there's a lot of people. And to me, the most exciting thing that I see is that young people are responding so much more to my story uh, and want to make a difference and make, make, make the world uh, a better place by uh, treating everybody the same. And uh, they are us, we, 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 we're, we're all one. And uh, uh, the other thing that I like to tell kids is that the most exciting thing in my life, outside of my, my children, grandchildren and great grandchildren, and it's volunteering, especially if it's with them. Uh, because with, when you volunteer, you volunteer for something you have a passion for. And you meet other people who have it. And uh, you have a, I, I haven't been with the uh, uh, group that uh, I sailed to the Soviet Union with, I don't know, it's uh, uh, 25 years or 20 years. And yet they, I, I re remain friends and support them. And uh, a lot of them are still uh, doing the same thing. And it's the same thing in anything I volunteer for. Are there any more questions? Hello, um, I've enjoyed listening to your story and I'm amazed at your sense of resilience. And I'm going to bring this back to what I know, and that is being a teacher. And how do we teach children who, who don't seem to have that desire to thrive that you have? How do we, how do we teach them? How do we make them want to have that desire? Or can we? And that's my question. Well, I certainly think we can. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think the key is, you know, if you see somebody being bullied, if a kid sees somebody being bullied, and uh, I don't ex expect the kid to go in there and uh, put themselves in danger. But if you reach out to the kid that's being bullied, you can make such a difference. One of, uh, you know, uh, the people who reached out to me, when I got uh, to the United States, soon after I went to Free Old High School, uh, and uh, at Field High School, this one kid came up to me and said, I just heard about you and I'm gonna be your friend till you, it, he, he was never really my friend, but he made a difference in my life. There was, there was somebody out there. And uh, when, when, you, you, when you volunteer for something, you always get so much more than you than you give it, it's it's not words it's the truth uh, uh i uh, ev everything i volunteered for in the past i wish i was still doing but uh i can't do everything uh i i have had one of the most amazing experience in prisons with people uh because they're human beings 
uh, some of them might have done something really bad, some of them didn't, but I had no interest in that. Uh, I have an interest when somebody uh, tells you and gives you a hug and said, this is the first time anybody has, uh, that I've let anybody touch me in the last 10 years. I was, oh my gosh, you know, or somebody else said, you know, I have the best relationship. Uh, this is after he took the third three-day workshop and he was a trainer. And he said, I know I'm in prison and I have the best relationship with my family that I ever had in my life. And uh, the, the, the joy of making a difference. Uh, I mean, I don't expect anybody else to do that, but if, if I see a bully, I try to reach out to them because a bully is somebody, a bully is somebody who has a low opinion of themselves. There is no such thing as a bully who really deep down believes he's worth anything. And the way he feels good is to push somebody else down. Well, let me see if I can get this guy to feel good about himself. And I have been able to do that. And uh, it has, and it has made a difference. Um, hi, I was just wondering how your experiences have influenced your faith throughout the years. Uh, I do have a hearing problem. Could you repeat that one more time? Of course. Um, I was just wondering how your experiences have influenced your faith throughout the years. Okay. Well, uh, I, I think Eli Wiesel uh, talked about uh, his faith being wounded, but for me, Hashem is in my heart, is in my soul, is in my brain. And the way I can reach him is by being a better person. And uh, so that faith I have, I love the Jewish culture. I, uh, I, I love uh, the, the, the services. Uh, but for me, when, when I... When I pray, I pray to myself to solve the situation, to make, to, to, to be better. I'm <clears throat> constantly disappointed that I, I know I'm not doing enough. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if I'm praying at all, it's to myself to be able to do a little bit more. I'm sure we have more. Um, and Manny, I want to tell you, I've been I've been reading some of the questions, and there are people who are thanking you for for telling them the story and for showing for your showing so so much resiliency, and that you can come come out of that experience and still and still do so much good. So, I, I think if anybody can uh, uh, think, okay, where did I make a difference this week? And if they can't come up with something, it's so easy, you know, write a letter, make a phone call, <laughs> uh, find, make a donation, find somebody who needs help. Uh, yes, yes. And, and, and then you're gonna feel better about yourself and you're gonna lead a better life. I honestly believe that. That's wonderful. Um, hi, I do have a question. Uh, uh, are there any current events that you would kind of like that remind you of what happened in the Holocaust? Well, when we separated uh, children from their parents, I, I went totally crazy because I know that many of those children will go through the trauma that I did. And uh, uh, what, what, what happened to me, the, the worst thing, the most traumatic moment of my life was not getting chased across the border and not living in, in a, on, on straw in a, in a, on the fourth story, crowded together with people. And uh, uh, it was getting separated from my parents. Uh, <laughs> And that was that. That was really 
uh, a trauma. It it took me it took took me a, a good part of a lifetime. Uh, I I think what I uh, what bothered me the most is once I realized what heroes my parents were turning their back and leaving me and saving my life and my brother's life. Uh, they were heroes. And yet I can remember my sister like she was here today and I so wiped them out of my mind that I have to recreate them. I, uh, so uh, w when I heard about the separation of kids at the border, I, uh, I went bananas, I, I went really crazy. One of the greatest, greatest joys of my life is when my grandchildren make a difference. That is uh, so fabulous. And uh, uh, I've got many stories uh, about my grandchildren and, and I, I, I hate it when grandparents start sort of bragging about their grandchildren. <laughs> But if they're making a difference, that's... Yes, yes. Hi. Um, I was wondering what kept you going, um, like when you were a kid and you were away from your parents, like was there something that like, like I guess like the kindness of other people or like, you know, all through all those tragedies that you had to face? I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I was, really a pain to everybody. <laughs> I was constantly in trouble. Uh, uh, I, I remember uh, about three years after I got to England, a stranger came up to me and put his hand on my shoulder and said, do you know who I am? And that was my brother and Siegfried and wow. Zig. And uh, uh, what, what, I, what I, so after that, uh, we, I saw him every, uh, every once in a while. And, uh, uh, but the one thing that happened to him as soon as he got to my hometown, he was called in by everybody to hear complaints about uh, the younger brother who was making trouble for everybody. So no, I didn't, uh, uh, so, somehow or the other, I just uh, bungled through it uh, some people ask me, uh, uh, being in Christian homes, did that uh, make you lose your faith? No, I, uh, I was constantly telling myself, they took everything away from me, but I'm Jewish and uh, I'm, I feel good about that. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, maybe that's what kept me going, I don't know. Thank you so much. Okay, one more, one more question. Mm -hmm. okay. We're looking for Daphne. We're we're all new. We're all new to this end of the uh, the Zoom <laughs> the Zoom camera. Oh, hello. Um, I was wondering what was uh, the most important thing that uh, you think humanity can learn about the Holocaust or from the Holocaust? Well, in, in Berlin, uh, I don't know, it was a couple of hundred German women, maybe it was more, I don't know, I'm not sure the, the exact things, who uh, were married to Jewish men and uh, I think it might've been 400 and they went to Nazi headquarters in Berlin. And they said, we're not budging until you stop it uh, with the persecution, with uh, sending Jews to concentration camps. Uh, and they had guns pointed at them and they didn't budge. And in the end, the uh, head of the Nazis there said, go home we will stop, we'll stop that. And they did. And those, the Jews in Berlin were able to live for the rest of the war. And what that tells you 
is that when you see something bad happening and you don't say anything, you don't write a letter, then you have become the problem because there's always going to be bad people and bad things happening. And if good people don't do anything and don't say anything, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes like to uh, tell a story and this did happen uh, at a school not that far away from where I live. Uh, there were uh, 100 kids waiting for the bus and uh, I could t tell t 100 stories like this. And two kids came and they grabbed one kid and they started beating him and he ended up in the hospital. 20 kids watched, 80 kids turned around and got on the bus. They turned away in disgust. And nobody, I didn't want anybody to go in there and start fighting. There were so many things they could have done and nobody did anything. Uh, and that was the reason the kid ended up in the hospital. Uh, I, 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 I think that when you, you hear somebody making a joke that's putting somebody down, putting a group down, and you smile, and or you just keep quiet. I, if somebody makes a joke about another group, uh, and most of my friends at one time or another, they've started to make a joke. And I said, wait a minute, you're a racist when you do that. And it, it immediately stops. And uh, if, if the speech stops, maybe the action will stop too. So uh, I, I think we can all change the world. Thank you very much. And, and one last, it's more of a statement, but you know, it's, it's something that, that's come through quite a bit. And we just want you to know how, how incredibly valuable that we all find your story and how much we deeply appreciate you sharing it all with us. And, and to say thank you is, is not enough. So that's from someone that wrote that in, but there's probably 20 in here that I'm paraphrasing. Well, thank you. Yes. All right. And I, I thank I thank you, Manny. I thank Annabelle for being there with you. And uh, I couldn't do anything without her. He <laughs> <laughs> started speaking. When we got married, he said two words to me. He said, "I never one word to our children." But when the grandchildren came, then we I never stopped. <laughs> I never said a word about my background to my kids, uh, uh, and but to my grandchildren, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess to me that meant I, I was on good footing. Ah, uh, you were, and you were ready to talk about it. Yeah. Well, we can't thank you enough. We hope we hope you come visit us in real life sometime soon. We can all get together. Would be. But lovely. I want to thank you again, and I want to also thank the the very creative and dedicated committee that makes this event possible. And this year was we had to be more creative than than usual. Um, but I'd like to thank Amy Robbins, Kathy Patterson, Diane Hugler, Jeremy Morse, Lisa Goldberg, Maureen Mines, Marcus Kantz, and Krista, Ca Krista Calkins. And many thanks also to Luke Robbins, who's the one who managed the technology tonight. And Thanks to all of you who participated and were patient on uh, waiting for us on the uh, on the Zoom, and I hope we can meet again in person next year. Thank you all. Thank you, Manny.